Hi guys. Welcome to a Sunday Night Live. I know it's been a while um, since we've done these. So I'm going to just give people a little bit of time to join in. Um, let me know how everything's going. Um, yay that you can, everything's working. And if you can in the comments, I'm just curious, um, for people to tell me where they're watching this, because we're trying a new, um, YouTube. Hi, Yoka. Um, or I'm trying a new YouTube um, streaming as well. So this is actually streaming on Facebook and my new YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, tell me in the comments, hi Jane, where, which page you are listening or watching from, I guess, um, Facebook or YouTube, because I'm curious to see. Um, I have a feeling most people are going to be Facebook since uh, the YouTube is pretty new. Oh my gosh, everyone's coming in. Hi, um, Malia and BJ, my Canadians. Um, so, <clears throat> We, hi Caroline and Connie. Oh, yay, a YouTuber. Yes, I'm excited for that. Um, okay, so just putting this out there, especially for people who aren't catching it live, this is recorded. It will be both on Facebook and YouTube. It should save there. So you will be able to watch this again um, on either place. And if you are watching it after it's recorded, welcome. Um, you can still ask questions in either place and hopefully I will get to them in a timely manner. So, okay, so now I'm gonna dive in. Um, we are talking about the big, um, I don't know if I wanna say controversy, but the big story of last week, um, a paper called Risk Factors for Cranial Cruciate Ligament Rupture in Dogs Participating in Canine Agility. Um, and hopefully some of you guys have had a chance to actually look at the paper. I did post the link on Facebook. So if you want to go back and get the paper, look in the comments under the Facebook live announcement, and there will be a link to the paper. It is open access, so everyone should be able to get the entire paper. How many of you guys actually were able to get it before this live and have looked through it? Um, hopefully you've looked through it and not, if you're interested in it and you're not just going off um, the infographic about it. So let me know if, if you guys have actually read it. Um, I am going to start going through it. And please feel free to ask questions along the way. Now, I am going to put a little bit of a disclaimer. I myself am not a major researcher. Um, so my big disclaimer for this paper is... If you try to ask me about some of the statistical analysis, like actually how the math is done and whatnot, I will not know the answer. Um, the statistics, um, at least in my case, um, I leave to the statisticians and I'm like, okay, here's all my data do what you can with it, explain it to me in the simplest terms possible. So I know for my own research, what was done. Um, but that also means I, I don't know all the statistic stuff. So that's, that's my disclaimer before we dive in. Um, because I do fear that people are going to ask me statistics questions and I will not know the answer. Um, so let's start at the beginning. So the first thing I, um, we want to do when looking at the paper is one, just figure out what they were trying to do, what they were trying to accomplish um, by doing this research. Um, and basically the, the most boiled down thing that they were looking at was um, actually trying to find out if there was, or what were the risk factors for cruciate ruptures in dogs actively engaged in agility training or competition. Um, and they were specifically trying to look for physical activity and fitness indicators, which I think is 
it's very interesting that that was their primary goal was physical activity and fitness indicators. But then it like bring like there's just a lot of stuff that came into that. And I think that's probably I'm skipping ahead, but that's probably issue number one is that it, we it wasn't narrowed down. It, it was just it, very, very broad. Um, and people can define the what they were doing differently and all that kind of stuff. So that's the first thing I like to know about with with the paper. What was what was their objective? Um, the other interesting thing um, I like to look at, which I think probably took, and I know it, it was actually in there. They did talk about it. So I like to look at kind of um, dates. So what's interesting to me about this paper is that um, the questionnaire went out in late 2015, early 2016. Um, so, and then it was published January of 2022. It's quite a big gap. Um, so that, that was one thing I, I found interesting. Another thing that I know is this paper, or not this paper, but the data or partial data was presented at a big conference in January 2017. So they'd already been um, crunching the numbers, let's say, um, very, very early after doing, getting all the, um, the surveys back. So I don't know, that's just kind of an interesting factor, I think, to look at is like, how long did it take from collecting the data to having it published? Um, so then the next thing I'm going to do really is uh, probably jump back to the conclusion um, because I think we get a lot of interesting disclaimers in the conclusion and it's really interesting or it's really good to see if, um, you know, what the authors recognize um, as problems with the study. Um, and then how we can kind of account with them. So if we go straight to the conclusion, and I'm literally reading from the last, the second to last paragraph. Um, there were three things that like I highlighted as being really important to recognize. Number one, veterinary health data obtained directly from owners through internet-based questionnaires rather than from veterinary medical records are subject to possible sampling, confirmation, and recall bias. I'm not going to say it's not just possible. <laughs> um, it definitely happens. We know this happens. So that's a really big kind of I'm not going to say red flag, but it's something we really have to take in mind when we are evaluating this paper. It was an internet survey. It was done by owners. Um, and a few other things that, I mean, this can go all the way back to 1996. So if the dog was participating in agility in 1996, they could still do the survey in 2015 or 16. That's 20 years that people are expected to remember everything. That's a long time. 20 years to remember what kind of physical activity you were doing with the dog in when it was doing agility in 96 and all these other things that were going on with the dog. And yeah, so... That's just keep that in mind. The second thing I highlighted was that this study had no independent confirmation of diagnosis of uh, cranial cruciate ligament rupture. Dogs were classified as a CCLR, cranial cruciate ligament rupture, or control, no rupture, based solely on the information provided by the owner. So we are trusting owners to remember a diagnosis correctly that could be as much as 20 years old. Now, obviously they weren't all 20 years old because it could happen anytime from 96 through whenever they took the survey, but 
that's another kind of like, okay, we've got this bias going on. The interesting thing is that of the dogs that, that report, or of the humans that reported that their dogs had a cranial cruciate ligament rupture, approximately 78% of the dogs were treated surgically. So we can probably say probably close to 78% truly were cranial cruciate ligament um, ruptures, but I, I would say even that might not be exactly. Like we'd like to think every owner knows, like when we tell them, hey, your dog tore its CCL and we're going to do this surgery to fix it, that they would remember that's what happened. Um, but I can tell you again from clinical experience, I've had many people come to see me after surgery and they don't understand what happened, what was wrong with their dog and what was just done. We have to go over all of that in the beginning of rehab. So probably close to 78%, but even that is a little bit of an unknown, but that leaves approximately 22% of the cranial cruciate ligament rupture dog group that we can't say for sure whether or not they actually had a cruciate ligament ru rupture because they didn't have surgical treatment for it. Um, and the researchers did not follow up with any of these, um, these dogs by like trying to get medical records to confirm it. They just took the owner's word, word for it. Again, I think we know, and probably some of you out there know this, um, there have been many times, and I, same in my experience, where we suspect it could be a partial cruciate ligament rupture, and that's what you're told, and it turns out to be something totally different. So again, that 22%, which, you know, it seems small, but 22% of, I think it was 206 dogs that were put in that group that's quite a significant number of dogs that may not have even had a cruciate rupture and are in this study. So that was the second thing I highlighted. And the third thing was um, the very last statement in that second to the last paragraph. And I think it's probably the most important and should be probably quoted in every, every time someone talks about this paper is the results of this study should therefore be interpreted with caution and careful consideration of the potential for distribution, respondent, and recall bias. So you guys know me. You know I would be so excited and shouting from the rooftops if I had something that I could say, look, we have evidence that doing fitness is going to prevent cruciate tears in our agility dogs. I would be out there trying to get everyone to, to do it. Um, and we can't do that from this paper. And I think it would be a little bit irresponsible to go out there and say this. I, like I said, 100%, you know, I would love, 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 love to have that evidence and be like, yes, everyone do the exercise. You know, I do that. Um, I want us all to do exercise, but I don't think that this is the paper that we can stand by and use as that evidence. To me, this paper opens up a lot more questions um, than answers things. And I do think we can take from this and, and really what we're supposed to do with these internet survey type papers is we're supposed to take the information that we're getting and, and I'm going to say really not even draw any conclusions from it, but take it and develop studies from it. So now we can say, hey, it looks like maybe, maybe some uh, fitness exercises could prevent cruciate tears. So why don't we enroll 
a hundred dogs, a hundred agility dogs in a prospective study where we follow them for five, 10 years of their agility career, keeping track of everything they do um, and putting some on an exercise program and some not on an exercise program, just letting them be dogs and see what happens. That's, that's the purpose of studies like this. It's to build other studies from it. So I want to kind of go over what's, what's interesting to me is um, when this was presented, I had some specific questions um, that I think are still present. So I'll talk about those. And then I had a colleague um, talk about another issue with this study that I hadn't even thought about. I think it, I, I think it was glossed over a little bit maybe when it was presented, so I didn't remember it. Um, but it's it's definitely valid. So the two things where I want to talk about is number one, um, body condition scoring. So we know, actually, before I'm going to take a step back, cruciate tears are one of the most highly studied um, issues in dogs, especially um, for anyone becoming, wanting to become a surgeon. So uh, to become, um, how do I want to say this? To get board certified in a specialty, you have to do research and present um, both to colleagues and be published to be able to get your board certification. So what that means is we all go out there and we try and find a project that we're interested in and we can write up. A lot of times for those becoming a surgeon, they're studying some factor of cruciate tears because everyone wants to be the person who actually figures out why cruciate tears happen. We don't know yet. All we know is there are factors that um, that definitely are make it more likely um, that a cruciate tear could happen, but we still don't know the exact reason. And uh, one thing I want to say, because I do think this often gets a little um, muddled out there, um, cruciate tears in dogs are completely different than cruciate tears in people. Um, and a lot of people want them to be the same. Like they know, oh, I went skiing and I tore my cruciate. And they know that it was basically activity-based. They turned the wrong way, put too much stress on it, it popped. We get the athletes, the soccer players, the football players that tear their cruciate. So it's, it's definitely in people much more related with certain physical activities. In dogs, we actually know that it is, um, it's a degenerative process. It is not, it is very, very uncommon for it to be activity related or um, like trauma related, like the dog was just out doing something and it tore. Now, a lot of times people think it does because oftentimes the dog is out doing something when it finally finishes tearing. And that is when the owner really notices the symptoms because the dog is like yelps and picks up the leg. But most of the time what's been occurring is there have been small tears along the way and the dog might have subtle symptoms that someone doesn't notice and then over time it continues to tear more and more and more until it finally fully tears. So that's why we get a lot of partial tears, why we see partial tears, especially in for those of us that are paying really close attention to our dogs. Again, probably not related to activity based on what we already know, um, but we don't know exactly why it starts. There's lots and lots of theories out there, but no one has been able to 100% definitively say this is why cruciate tears happen in dogs. And, you know, as soon as they do, that's great. Because once we know what causes it definitively, then we can say, okay, now we know how to prevent it because we can stop whatever it is from happening. Um, so what we do know is that body condition plays an extremely important role or um, in 
tearing cruciate. It more often happens in dogs that have a poor body condition score. Um, and this is where potentially activity can play a role because if you are asking your dog that's in a poor body condition to do a lot of heavy activity, like go play chuck it for an hour every day, yeah, maybe that does add to um, the potential for tearing it more. We also know genetics play a factor. Um, so, and that's something that's been studied in a few breeds, but it hasn't completely been figured out. Um, also, we know that age is a risk factor as dogs get older, um, more likely that they'll tear cruciate. We also know that um, time of spay or neuter can affect it. So if you've got an early pediatric um, spay or neuter, those dogs do have a tendency to be at more risk for cruciate tear. So those are some of the things we know. And this paper does, um, uh, recognize those. What's interesting is I, some of the things that I had questions about, I don't think they necessarily accounted for. Um, but real quick before I get into that, Beth asked, was the journal that it was published in a peer-reviewed journal? Beth, I believe the answer is yes, but I will be perfectly honest and say um, this was not a journal I was familiar with when I saw what it was, where it was published. Um, I had, I had to look it up. Um, and I unfortunately didn't have time to really dive deep into it. Um, but it's, yeah. Um, it was not one of the ones that I right away was, um, familiar with. Um, and I don't see it noted really obviously, um, on the printout that I have. Um, so maybe someone can, can search that really quick and let us all know. Um, so, um, let's talk a little bit. So what I'm going to dive in, I, you know, just don't have time tonight to go into everything. Okay. Abby, um, says, I think it is other being, C journals are peer reviewed. So um, good to know. Um, I'm going to dive into just the um, relations to breed because um, obviously one of my breeds, actually both my breeds were singled out. Um, one good, one bad. Um, and I definitely had questions about this when it was presented. Um, so I'm going to talk about Australian Shepherds um, because they actually dedicated a whole section about the increased risk associated with Australian Shepherds. Um, because I think it was Australian Shepherds Labradors and Rottweilers all had slightly increased risk compared to um, Border Collies had a lower risk, which was a, a lot of people found interesting, but also Border Collies were the most repre represented in the number of controls. So like there were 37 Border Collies in the numbered injured group, but there were 229 Border Collies in the number of controls versus the Australian Shepherd um, only had 82 dogs in the control versus 41 in the, the injured. Um, so one of the things I asked um, when this was brought up with breeds was, how the author was accounting for the owner's basically reporting of body condition score. Um, because we know that 
there's there's a study and I should have looked it up so I could cite it for you guys, but um, I didn't So because it was an agility weekend and I just didn't have time. Um, so we know it has been shown that owners ha do a poor job of evaluating dog's body condition score and they always undervalue it, meaning if um, the dog's body condition is a five out of nine, owners will rank it a four out of nine. Um, and they did a study of this where they actually took dogs and they had a vet evaluate the dog and a and the owner evaluate it. And reliably, the owner under um, underrelated the their own, their own dog. So their dogs were actually a bad body condition score, and they were saying it was a good body condition score. So for me, and I'm sorry for those of you out there with these breeds, but for me, I do tend to see the trends that Aussies, Australian Shepherds tend to be more overweight than they should. Um, and, you know, they're still doing agility because they have that drive. Um, same with Labrador Retrievers. Um, same with Rottweilers. And I'd say even the Australian Cattle Dogs, but it is funny, like, I just, I don't see a lot of Australian cattle dogs, but those do tend to be breeds that one, they already have a heavier height to weight ratio, meaning that if they're so tall, 20 inches tall, their normal weight is maybe we'll say like 40 pounds versus a border collie that's 20 inches tall. Their normal weight is like 30 pounds. So there's that different ratio but that could be a factor. But then also, I think there's the issue that these dogs could have been reported as being an ideal weight and they actually weren't. Um, and especially with the breeds that had higher risk, I see that as a problem. I see a lot of, and again, um, I, I just, I, you know, there are border collies that are overweight as well that are running agility. Um, but it just, I don't know, it tends to, like, I I see more of, of those. And when I asked, I said, you know, how is body condition controlled for? Because we know owners are not great at reporting an accurate body condition. The answer was, well, these are all agility dogs, so they should all, all be a good weight. And I just go, ooh, where? No, no. <laughs> That's not actually what's happening in the agility world. I wish it was. I wish, I mean, I would go on a campaign to agility instructors. I mean, maybe it's something I should do is like teach them how how to assess body condition and how to talk to owners in a nice way about getting the dogs in shape to do agility. So that was one of the big things that I saw as a problem. And since we know weight and body condition is an issue, um, oh, I just, I just, that, that left a big yucky feeling for me with this of saying like certain breeds were more at risk and less at risk. Um, so let's see. Um, Tracy asks about, do they control for things like hip scores or other underlying orthopedic issues? Um, I don't know. I actually don't know if that was a question that was asked um, or if that like threw the dogs out, if they had other... Um, other orthopedic problems. I did not actually go to the index and get the exact surveys, um, even though they are available. Um, so there's additional file one and additional file two, and those are the actual surveys that went out. And I will say I did not have the time this weekend to go through the surveys. Um, but that is the those are interesting questions um, because, yes, oftentimes a dog will, as you know, Tracy, um, 
have be diagnosed with one orthopedic issue and then we find out they actually have a lot of others and it could they could be all working together so that that's an interesting in, thing to think about as well so the next thing i wanted to talk about is actually something that abby brought up and i think this is more intriguing than even my body condition issue <laughs> um so this looked at dogs it basically anyone could answer the questions if their dog was doing agility between 1996 and the time of the survey obviously that's a long time um but what's interesting what we need to think about is when all these other things became popular that they compared to so in 1996, I'm going to say probably the only other sport that was happening was obedience. Um, I fly ball was coming around, but I believe it was still only in England, maybe. I don't think it was in the States yet by that time. Um, but a lot of things that showed a positive association, so positive meaning maybe it has a preventative type effect, didn't come into popularity until later in this 20 year time period. So if I think back of when was the first time that I was introduced to canine fitness, I'm going to say it was 2006. So right there, that's already 10 years of dogs who potentially are reporting that they had cranial cruciate ruptures that could could not indicate that they were doing any kind of canine fitness as it was described. Like, I think it was, they talked about like using inflatables and stuff like that. So, um, so that's 10 years. And I'm going to say in 2006, I knew about it, but it was not popular um, out in the world of canine sports. I'm going to say really canine fitness started to make waves after 2010. And I'm being generous saying 2010. So that's almost 15 years of time period where canine fitness wasn't happening, that they're collecting data on. The other thing is to look at like when these sports that again, our, our preventative came in. You know, when we look at like dock diving, um, nose work, barn hunts, those were all much, much later versus fly ball. So they say there's a negative effect with fly ball, but that's also been the second, like I would say obedience was happening um, while like in the beginning, so then early 1996, um, and then probably fly ball was actually the next sport. Cause I'm going to say that was definitely early two thousands that it was, yeah, it was starting to gain popularity and rally came on after that, because I remember competing in a rally the first year it was an AKC event and that was 2005 maybe. And I was our, like, I was already doing fly ball. Um, so, um, that's, you know, we have to think about that of like when all these happened, um, that there's all these possible people answering the survey that these, these activities weren't available to them. So we don't really know how it correlates to their cruciate tear. Um, so that was something that um, Abby brought up to me that I just like opened my eyes and hopefully Abby, I explained it correctly because I just was like blown away by that thought and was like, well, that's, that's, that creates a problem with, with the data collection. I mean, it, uh, I don't know. It just, it, it was one of those things that I was like, probably no one would really think about that unless they really knew the history of like canine sports and canine fitness and like when all of this was happening. 
Um, the other thing that I, I have to point out um, while I kind of strategically wait to see if Abby has anything to comment about that um, was the paragraph or the couple sentences that they wrote about UKI agility, um, which again, I happen to be a, 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 a UKI fan. Um, but I just thought this kind of, again, highlighted maybe not full understanding of, of exactly what's going on in the sports. Um, so what I liked, I liked, I laughed, I laughed out loud is, is this, um, this sentence. UKI agility events are characterized by generally higher jump heights, which that has never been the case. Um, the highest jump height in UKI has always been 24. The highest jump height in AKC is 24. Um, for many, many years, USDA had the highest jump height at um, 26. Oh, I guess AKC had 26 for a while too. So there you go. UKI never had 26. So, um, so UKI agility events are characterized by generally higher jump heights, more tightly spaced obstacles, minimum distance of 12 feet, tighter turns at speed, and options for backside approaches to jumps, throttles, and similarly athletically challenging course elements. And just the more tightly spaced obstacles jumped out at me because I do think that if you are active in the sport, <laughs> whether or not, you know, you do all of them. I think we can all agree that of, well, I'm going to call it the big four, AKC, um, USDA, UKI, and NADAC. Um, and I'll say five, ASCA, throw that one in there too, since they talked about it. I'm not going to talk about AAC since that's Canadian and I really don't know a lot about it. But of the big five um, that were mentioned in the paper, I think we can all agree that AKC has the tightest spaced obstacles. Um, and then UKI is probably, I would say UKI is, is more towards the biggest space. Um, so yeah, I, Tracy, I agree. I didn't look it up, but when I read that they had a 12 foot minimum, I was shocked and I was like, that can't be true, but I did not take the time to go through the rule book. Because again, agility weekend, I just didn't do it. Um, we know that um, AKC has an 18 foot minimum, and I always thought that was the smallest minimum in my my circle. But I'm pretty limited to these days AKC, um, a little bit of USDA and UKI. I used to do ASCA, um, and basically stopped ASCA when I got an Aussie with a tail. But I used to do a lot of ASCA and I thought, again, ASCA and NADAC fairly spread out um, obstacles. I don't know what their minimum is, but um, so yeah, I just, again, that kind of like reading something like that, I just, I almost am like, I wish they had like a sport advisor or something. I don't know. Um, let's see. Bath asks, did they, did they totally confuse USDA and UKI? I don't, I don't know. Um, they definitely had people respond about USDA, um, but they mostly um, kind of, I think the two outliers were NADAC and UKI. And so that's why those were the ones that got talked about. Although, yeah, because they threw out AAC or didn't really talk about it because it was a low number of people who actually did that. Um, UKI had a, had a low risk factor. Um, and NADAC was 
2.2. So NANAC was fairly high, whereas AKC was almost even. It was 1.1. So, um, and let's see, CPE was 1.2 and USDA was 0 0.7. So those were all kind of closer to that 1.0 of like neither negative or positive risk. And so I think that's why they mostly talked about the two outliers in the conclusion, NADAC and UKI. Um, yeah, so Amanda, I'm glad you're here to tell us. So minimum is 18 and average is about 20 to 22. I was going to say, from what I remembered, I always felt like NADAC at slash ASCA um, distances were generally more than AKC, um, even though the rules are similar. Okay. So based on what you and Abby discussed, the low risk factor for UKI might be based on a short history and lower entry numbers. Exactly. It totally could be because UKI is the newest one. Um, I do also think, and, and this was interesting, like when they presented it, um, which didn't end up in here, but when they presented it, or when I read, I remember it was, they also looked at the demographics of the handlers. And again, I, I don't want to make anyone feel bad, but generally that was also very different between NADAC and UKI. Um, particularly if we think about like potential handler response time, um, you know, and so that could also play a factor. Like that's one thing that, unless I skipped it, was not talked about at all, um, was handler demographics and how that could relate to, um, some of these these issues. Um, I think, like to me, um, when I talk about returning to sport after an injury, one of the biggest things that I talk about is like, if you are not on time with your handling, you don't get to do call-offs anymore. Um, because I think uh, that's what I would investigate <laughs> is somehow if we could like sit and watch, like have an observer go and watch a trial and like take data on like the handling and the dogs, like how are they getting the last minute call off? Is the handler screaming at them of like, no, not that one. And like making them suddenly change their trajectory and then getting history from those compared to handlers that aren't doing call offs. Um, I think that would be really interesting to me because that's that's something. And again, I have no data about it. But for me, when I'm returning clients, I'm like, you don't get to do that anymore. If the dog is going to the wrong obstacle and you have realized that and they are committed to that obstacle, you do not get to scream and try and get them to do the right thing. You just let them do it and then you go on. Um, another interesting thing for me is I actually, because of that same reason, um, don't often recommend people doing lower jump heights, um, because most dogs tend to go faster at lower jump heights, which then leads to the potential for wanting to do more call it call offs. So, um, and I think I, you know, I, there's just so many factors that, that are, that, are, could be playing a role in some of these um, results. So I have talked mostly about what, like the big points that I wanted to talk about. So I do want you guys to ask questions at this point. My plan is to not go past an hour. So that gives us about 15 minutes um, from this point on. Um, to go for it. And while we're doing that, there was something else I kind of that I just thought of that I wanted to point out in here. But um, anyway, so Amanda says, I agree, late poor handling, I think plays a huge role with injuries. To me, 
that is the thing I want to investigate. That to me is more potential of of a risk factor than a lot of the other things. Um, so though I, I remember what I wanted to talk about because it has to do with the physical conditioning. Um, so my issue with the physical conditioning activities is that they didn't really narrow them down all that much. Um, so meaning there are pretty broad categories out there that leave a lot to interpretation. Um, so for example, um, fetch games. So fetch games means playing ball or Frisbee, whatever. You're throwing something, the dog goes and gets it and brings it back. What I'm not sure is like, was there some kind of cutoff? Like if you throw something once in a blue moon or, you know, maybe one or two times a day, does that count as actively participating in a fetch game? Or did you have to meet some kind of time criteria? Like, oh, we play fetch for 30 minutes. We play fetch for an hour. Um, the next one is, I mean, I think you could kind of say all of all of these kind of leave those open. Um, so like um, swimming versus no swimming. Well, yeah, my dogs have swam in their life, but they don't swim regularly. So um, the big one that I think is is the one everyone probably is is interested in is the core strength, balance, stretching, and body awareness exercise. So again, fairly broad terms, not really diving in and defining those. Like what is a core, what is working on core strength? Because honestly, about any exercise like I've ever assigned to someone, I could count as core strength. Um, there's probably a good good chance the core is being activated. Um, but we don't know. Balance. So, you know, if you just put, and again, early days of canine fitness, the thing was to get a peanut and just put your dog on the peanut, have them stand on the peanut. And that would count as probably both core strength and balance. So is that really doing that much? Because now we're like, yeah, that's probably not doing much of anything. Um, so lots of questions with that. Um, and again, like stretching is in there. So why isn't stretching a separate category? Because I would say stretching is completely different than core strength, balance, and body awareness. Um, I would even make body awareness a separate thing, but they were all lumped together. So anyway, that was the last little thing. I do think also like there's issues with the running, short hike or runs, long heights or runs, like all of that is, again, I just think that there's potentially a lot of um, respondent bias in those. Like, cause I know I'm the first to admit, like my dogs don't get walked every day, not on a like actual, like we're going on a leash, we're walking around the neighborhood or going out to the trails where they can run. But the amount of running they do in the backyard is probably more than the average dog. And I do encourage that by like going and walking around the yard with them. Now, if someone were to ask me, do you walk your dogs every day? I would probably say no, because I define walk as putting them on a leash and going outside and walking them around the neighborhood. I don't do that. Um, I know full well when I ask people, when I'm again developing a program and I say, well, how often, how often do you walk your dog or what's, you know, what's your daily routine? I know I don't get the full truth. I probably get mm, maybe 25 to 50% truth. So asking people, you know, on a survey, like, I just, I don't know. I just, maybe I'm a little cynical, but I think, 
I think there's a lot of, like, they tried hard to define the hikes, the walks and stuff. And it, I, yeah, I don't, don't think it came out as well. Um, so yeah, Charlotte says the walks versus hikes is so ambiguous. I agree. Like I read through these and I, like when I read through, I was like trying to decide like what category my dogs would have fit into. Um, because I would say, well, they run and play with every dogs, uh, with, run and play with other dogs every day. Cause I've got multiple dogs and I don't just take them out one at a time. Are they really playing? Probably. I probably wouldn't say no, they're not playing, but they're running around. Um, and there's multiple dogs running around at once. Um, short hikes or runs less than 30 minutes on flat terrain. Well, like, does the terrain have, I mean, it's just, I don't know. Like that's, I feel like you could really, and I know I did like, got myself all wrapped up in like, well, what, I don't know, like where I take them for a walk where they can be off leash, which I would consider a hike or I get, you know, there's a big hill at first, but then it's mostly flat. So is that flat terrain or hilly terrain? You know, I don't know. So I don't know. It was very interesting to me. Um, okay. Leah, I'm trying to show you. Okay. There. Do you think the point about increased risk for novice level competitors points to novice handler error or pet parents dabbling in agility for fun with dogs who may be out of shape? Yeah. See, that's a great, great question because it could be both. Um, definitely um, the novice issue of like, could it, you know, um, they're not quite ready, they're unsure, but I don't think they factored in the difference between first time novice versus experienced novice. Um, I'm not sure that was separated out because I would say, yeah, like my first, my novice A dog was a completely different experience than the rest. I do think that the potential novice thing could go back to body condition scoring um, because, again, a lot of people are maybe encouraged to do agility as an activity to help their dog lose weight or, you know, just for fun to build some confidence or, um, you know, have an activity. And it's not talked about how um to get them in shape for it first or that's the only activity they do like i think it would be really interesting to look at um like what do you do to actually prepare for agility do you just go to agility class once a week and compete and you don't do anything else because even if your dog is a good weight i'd say they're probably not in shape for actual agility and there's more potential for problem there. Um, so Abby has an answer though. That's probably better than mine about this. So I'm going to pop it up. It may not show the whole thing, but Oh, I guess it did. So, um, so being a retrospective survey, so people who had a dog injured couldn't progress more likely to be a novice open, but people who didn't have an injured dog are more likely to fill out the survey for their most experienced masters. Excellent dog. Oh, that's really interesting, Abby. Um, do you remember, I, I'm not sure if I filled out this survey for my dogs, um, but I'm wondering if you know, Abby, was there a limit that you could only fill it out for one dog? I feel like I did something where that, that was a thing. You had to pick one dog and that was it. They didn't let you go back in and, and do it for multiple dogs if you had them. So, so it's interesting that people who potentially had a dog injured couldn't progress, more likely to be a novice open, but people didn't have an injured dog. Okay, so that means, yeah, so there would be more people in the CCLR group of novice open and more people in the control group that are in master's excellent because they were able to keep going. They didn't have to stop. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah. 
So probably, yeah, shouldn't even, shouldn't even be considered. Um, so, um, Abby, we really need prospective living collected data. Yeah. So that's kind of what I was like, I would love, and I don't like, I don't know how to do it. I definitely don't have the time, but yeah, we need to somehow like, like I was saying, enroll dogs for like a five, 10 year study where we can actually like track them and see what's happening. Um, and actually my, my pet peeve, have someone evaluate them for body condition, not just trust the owners. So, <laughs> um, okay. Abby isn't sure for this survey if having restricted it for people with multiple dogs. Yeah. I can't remember. I just feel like at some point I remember one of the surveys that I was like, Oh, okay. I'll take this for all my dogs that are actively competing. And then, but the, for some reason it like only let me do one, but there have been a lot of surveys, so I don't know. But I feel like it was quite a while ago, so that's why I think it might have been this one. Um, like, the time period kind of matches up because of when I first moved to Washington State. So, um, so Charlotte says, plain, um, are they running around or T-boning each other? Far too many variables with behavior. Exactly. Because for me, you know, if they're just, you know, running around the yard and not like touching each other. They're just running. Like I might call that, I might define that as playing um, versus, yeah, they're actively engaged, like even more than just like T-boning. They could also just be like wrestling or, you know, all, dogs have lots of different play styles. So does that create an issue? I don't know. Um, so Okay, guys, I've got about five minutes left. So any last questions, pop them in there. Um, I, what I kind of wanted to, to end with was talking a little bit about kind of what, what we can do to be, do the best for our dogs. And I think there, there are things that are out of our control and there are things that are in our control and like out of, um, out of control are things like, you know, once we have the dog, things like genetics, you know, we don't know, um, what their genetic predisposition is. Now, when we're, when we're searching for our next dog, we can definitely ask, Hey, have any close relatives ever had a cruciate tear? Um, because there might be like, if a bunch of close relatives have, that could be an indicator that maybe this dog is at risk for it, or this puppy that you're looking into is at risk for it. I think things we can control are body condition score. Um, I think that's the biggest factor. And I do think that that's potentially where fitness adds in, right? Because generally speaking, if we're doing a lot of canine fitness, we're probably maintaining a good body condition score for our dog. Now, I will love, obviously, like I said at the beginning, I am dying to have that paper that says fitness is going to help prevent cruciate tears. Um, I think kind of logically, like I said, I can make that connection that if you're doing a, like fitness work with them, they're probably going to have a better body condition score, which probably helps them avoid having injuries, including cruciate tears. Um, but I definitely can't sit there and say, if you do exercise X, Y, and Z, you have less likelihood of getting a cruciate tear. Um, so that's, that's a big thing that you can control, um, versus things you can't control. Um, so Mickey says, I, I would love to understand what is meant by short walks with hilly terrain. You know, to me, again, what I thought of when I, I read that was like, 
if I lived in downtown Seattle and I wanted to do like a 30 minute around a couple blocks walk, it would be very hilly because basically I'd be like walking uphill, very steep uphill one direction and downhill the opposite direction. Um, so that's kind of, that's what popped into my head. But someone else might, yeah, define hilly differently, you know, because like I said, like where I take them to walk, like, yeah, there's there's changes in elevation during the walk. But I also spend a lot of time in Colorado. And so I would not consider what I what I do out there hilly, um, especially if I compare it to downtown Seattle or I compare it to, you know, back in the mountains of Colorado. So I don't know. It's it's hard. Um, so. Anyway, I want to wrap it up since we hit seven o'clock. Um, I, like I said, this, this will be posted so you guys can watch it replay anytime. Definitely feel free to keep asking questions in the comments. Um, I will try to get them as best I can. Um, and then I'm probably going to do, I don't know, I was thinking about doing some kind of little free um, ebook that just talks a little bit about like what I ended, like what, what can we do to help our dogs um, try to have injury free lives. So um, check that out. Hopefully I'll have that soon, available soon. And I'll post, of course, um, in Facebook when it is. I don't think I can post it on YouTube, but um, I'm glad everybody joined me. This was a really awesome discussion. I had a lot of fun. I'm glad that this paper is out there because I do think it brought a lot of awareness and interest, which is always beneficial. Um, so, you know, keep keep pushing us, keep pushing the scientists, the researchers, the veterinarians, um, because, you know, we need that push to keep doing more and more and more. It's, it's really nice to have it. Um, and I do think, like I said, this is, this doesn't necessarily answer a lot of questions, but it creates a lot of questions, which is always good in research and science to just keep asking questions. So I am happy that this paper did get published and did get studied. And I don't think, you know, we should totally take it as a negative um, thing. I think it's just been awesome that it's brought this discussion to light. So I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of Sunday night. Um, and Monday day to Charlotte. Um, I don't know if there is anyone else out um, <laughs> from New Zealand on here, but if there is, happy Monday. Um, and I will see you guys on the interwebs. Bye.